Hey everybody, um, it's Saturday. Can you believe it? October 1st. Wow, cannot believe we are at the, the 1st of October. Time is moving by quickly. <laughs> I'm already thinking Christmas, how about you? Anyway, I hope that you've already prayed. If not, take a moment and pray and go and read your Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 8 through 12 is where we're moving on to today. So I'll I'll be sitting here patiently. Okay. I hope you really do turn, pause the video and do that. <laughs> or maybe you do it beforehand. But anyway, so we are picking up with verses 8 through 12. So I'm going to real quick read those. Um, well, we're going to read them as we go because we've, you've already read it, right? try to get used to that, right? So anyway, we look at verse 8, and again, as you're studying the Word, this is probably very old hat for you, and our pastor does the same thing, and um, whenever you get to a passage like verse 8, it says, He therefore that despises, that despiseth, despiseth not man but God who hath also given us unto his Holy Spirit. Now we're starting off in the toward the end of a full letter of teaching from Paul. So we have to remember context, context, context. So very important that we never take it out of context. We finished over I think a three week period. Um, maybe it was four. It was heavy stuff. Uh, the beginning of chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, that talked about such things as sexual purity, sanctification, possessing your vessel, and sanctification and um, honor. We discussed a lot of vocabulary, what the Greeks were, Greek word for these words that we get translated into English, and what they defined as, and so that we understood the differences between fornication and adultery. They're not the same thing. It's the same action involved with whether someone's married or unmarried. We also um, looked at in those passages dealing with lusting after unlawful, um, ungodly, worldly desires, um, not to defraud one another, which is like leading people on, um, desiring after things that belong to them, that the Lord is the one who avenges and is in verse 6. And then you get to the very key verse there of that part of the passage, the letter that he's writing. Um, remember, uh, Timothy went back to Thessalonica after Paul and Silas and Timothy kind of fled. And he brings back to Paul later good reports on the church there in Thessalonica. Um, he helped establish more of the leadership and was training them since they had to flee so quickly. And so as we get to the end of the letter, which is very the way Paul does his teaching in his writings, is he's he's dealing with concerns. So this what we see in chapter 7 are concerns that Paul is dealing with of what the report was from Timothy. And then when you get more, um, well, we're going to get to it next week when we get into the next passage with verses 13 and on, um, we will deal with, uh, with some other issues, concerns that the people had. So here he is, he's talking about all this with them. And in verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That is a difficult thing. And um, as we learned just through the definitions of learning what those words like concupiscence means, um, all of that, for a people who their culture, not just they grew up bad or didn't have good parentages. And trust me, 2000 years ago, they had a lot of broken families um, and people were sold off by their own parents into slavery or into training trades and all that kind of stuff. It was, um, but their culture alone, ooh, kind of like ours today, the culture itself was very, <clears throat> and it was worldly because it wasn't of 
that what the Hebrews knew at the time, and it definitely wasn't the kingdom to come that Jesus called others to. And now the Gentiles were coming into the church totally not having any knowledge of God the Father to Israel and all of the stories and purity and all the things that they did to physically pretend clean the outside that they had to, although it would never did them any good, they had to do it over and over again, right? The people who were not Hebrew, they didn't understand about being holy. They grew up in a culture and family. It was nothing if somebody was a part of a guild, a, a, a father and husband who maybe had two wives and maybe 12 kids, and he's a part of the, um, the statue building guild of whatever town and village. And part of that culture, which was perfectly fine to have multiple marriages, lots of children, even from multiple, not just wives, but concubines. Oh yeah, the Jews were kind of used to that too, weren't they? That, but that wasn't God's calling. Then they become Christians, which when you hear the leadership talk about um, be the husband of one wife, men who were married, and it was, you know, acceptable when they come to the Lord, they have three wives and all those kids. They weren't to put them aside and divorce them because God didn't want them to make it worse. But in church leadership, only men who were husbands to one wife could be in leadership because God called man and woman, one man, one woman. And so it was to be an example to the church as it moved forward. So hopefully the children of all those multiple married uh, women and children and husbands and however the family situations were, would learn an example as they moved forward. Hopefully the children under um, being finally reared up in a in with godly parents and learning the ways of Christ and what purity and sanctification looked like instead would put aside the things of the world and move forward these are also the same men and women that came to Christ that were used to and grew up in religious culture that may have had their family with outside their door having um they would have multiple little shrines that could be to multiple uh, deities, including always you were to include the emperor, but um, also because of the dad's guild, if he was an uh, uh, iron worker or, you know, whatever kind of, they had guilds. Part of all of that work in culture also included the sexual immorality of which is where this all you know he's he's dealing with people that are coming from this very heathen godless society that would have included sexual orgies the guild members and their spouses or guild members alone it would be typically normal to be a part of going to the to the guild conference tonight and they discuss the things that they have to discuss about their business and part of being part of the guild would be to participate in all of the activities with male and female sexual slaves pretty much and temple worship they had um diet i can't say the name dionysus it was the party god you had baruch the party god that part of it was the not just women but young men the sexual um priests or whatever that it was part of your responsibility as a member and in your worship to include all that so you've got all the crazy heathen wicked ways that these people have been going through their generations it was part of their culture and then they come to christ who has saved them has redeemed them they are being told multiple times that they're purchased with the price i just studied in first corinthians and um in first corinthians 7 paul's answering questions to the corinthians with that, that you know what do we do about marriage and do we I, I, i'm a believer and he's an unbeliever what do i do do i divorce him blah 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 and and he's dealing with all of that and he constantly repeats holiness over uncleanness um purity 
sanctification, seeking to be pure. That was not, they considered themselves to be perfectly upright in the ways that they were before. But now in Christ, that's not okay. In Christ, even if that was perfectly fine with your spouses and all that you did, now you, the man, would have to do something for his whole family and make decisions that would break them from all of that past of theirs. Now, if it was a woman who came to Christ and she was caught in all this, well, Paul gives instructions in 1 Corinthians 7, and and unfortunately, it could they would have been left, you know, now, once they were discovered to be Christians, the husband may have put them aside and divorced them and sent them and their children off to where they would technically be the widows in the Christian church that had nobody to go to because their husband wouldn't have anything to do with somebody that followed that rebellious um, Jesus or whatever. So many different things. But it's also the same today, especially in the Muslim world. People that come to Christ, they not only are shunned, they are marked for death and it is nothing it is nothing if you have never heard the stories of what happens to young people and women who and men but especially the women and the children who come to christ and it becomes known um literally their family can kill them and just leave them on the street nothing will be done to whoever kills them because they were apostates and death is what they deserve and so many flee and that's okay I mean that's what America's always been known for but they will try to come here and follow after them and that is sad and and they can never go home for many of them um, but once they become a believer um, Sharam Hadian was a Muslim although he wasn't really you know he really didn't follow and practice so much but his parents were Muslim and when they fled um, from the Ayatollah back in the day when um, his dad, if you've never heard uh, Sharam, you can find him on Facebook. Uh, those of us, you may have heard some of his teaching. He tries to share with people truly what Muslims stand for and to warn people about what they're doing here in America and what they want to do and take over the American society. He grew up in that, steeped in that. His father, they they were more westernized, didn't really practice per se, but I believe that both his mother and his, at least his father died n refusing to listen to his son and for many years being shunned after he came to Christ. And, and, but he has a mark. Um, he is an apostate Muslim and in America he's pretty safe, but he knows that um, if he ever travels back, of course, right now in Iran, he's never been able to go back because the Ayatollahs in um, Iran, but um they're marked and it, it, it's a terrible thing, but it's the price that people pay as they come out. So here he says, "You ha God hath not called us unto uncleanness, referring to the ways of their lifestyle and whatever ways that they used to be a part of, but he has called us unto holiness. So then he does the therefore. So therefore, dis those that despise. So what is despising it? Sometimes the teachings that we get from the scripture, we don't like. When you preach the gospel or you teach it to your children in their rebellion and they don't like the idea of, what do you mean I can't drink and do drugs and whatever I want to do? Well, that's ungodly. That's sinful. We are not, well, if they don't like the message you give them that comes from the word, it's not about us. It's about their rebellion against God. And it very clearly says that therefore, referring to all the teaching about the lifestyle, the immorality, um, possessing your vessel and all of that, if you don't like that, if you desire and want to lust after the worldly, un even unlawful, disgusting things of the world, you can despise the teaching all you want, but it's not against me and it's not, it's against God. That's what it's saying. Look, don't, don't, go, don't get upset with the message of this, it's not, I'm not being mean. It's the word. It's the truth. And you take it up with God. And that's something we have to remember, ladies, as believers. Number one, we can't sway anybody. We may try. And as mothers, we may have really tried. 
And I will tell you, I, I thought that, you know, it was a person's choice. I hadn't comprehended the doctrines of grace and understanding that there's nothing that I could do to even repent unless the Lord gave me the spirit of repentance and realizing shedding the scales off my own eyes that I could see I was a sinner and that I was in need of a savior. And then he gives us the grace and the faith to step forward and receive the gift and become a child of God that our children, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, if they are lost, they are lost. We're to share the gospel because that's a command because nobody can come to Christ that they don't hear the word of God. And we won't even get into what it means about deaf people because there are ways to communicate with them. But the speaking forth the truth from the word is the only thing that through the Holy Spirit leads people to Christ. Along with that, with the rebelliousness that they fight against it, we cannot convince them that they should live godly ways when they're not in Christ. And this is a letter written to the church. So as new believers come into, into the church, number one, if they have no openness and humility and brokenness to realize that they need to live a changed life, they want to come as... Oh, have we not heard this? It's sung on Christian radio stations in our churches. Come as you are. Come as you are. Come as you are. But with a humble heart and ready to change. Because you aren't supposed to stay as you are in your wicked, sinful ways. You're supposed to be open to the Holy Spirit changing you and making you like Jesus. This whole garbage of come as you are. God loves you as you are. God the Father can't even look upon us except that the blood of Christ covers us. I don't know that I'd say it's good to come as you are and stay as you are. We want to become more like Christ, but thankfully, even with all of our vain efforts to try to be like Jesus, it's only his own personal blood that covers us that the God, creator, Elohim of the universe can even look upon us, let alone put up with us for all eternity, right? <laughs> But Jesus, who died for us and purchased us with his own precious blood, he works with the Holy Spirit within us to change us to be like him. So here we go. This Anybody that thinks that they don't have to live that way, their entire denominations, that the disciples of Christ, there are differing levels of being disciples. And it's perfectly acceptable to come in and just be, you know, a believer and have your ticket stamp for heaven and you don't have to I mean they only walk around with the New Testament and it only matters what Jesus said the words in red and you know the differing levels well if you're called to be more holy holy well then you're called to that but if you're not it's okay no that's not what scripture ever teaches and never throw out the Old Testament say oh well it was all fulfilled so we don't have to read it eh. That isn't the truth either because Jesus spoke it. So I think you ought to know, right? So we're called to be holy. And if you don't agree or you don't like the holiness standard, which is Christ, you got to take it up with the big man because that is not on your pastor. That is not on your teacher. That is not on whoever has maybe come to you and shared with you that maybe something you're doing is not appropriate or it's not God honoring, maybe you should consider making a change in how you talk or what you do. If you take up offense on that, and sometimes we can be offensive coming across with that, and that's something totally different. But the in principle, if you're not hum if you don't have humility and humbleness to take that message and go to God's word and in the spirit, be open to confess your sin and that you want to be more like Jesus, then there's something wrong with you. There is. And maybe, are you really a believer? Have you truly repented of your sin and become a believer that you want to be a slave to Jesus? Because all the words in the New Testament referring to being a servant of Christ, that word is doulos, and that only refers to a slave, as we completely understand slave. And if you are not in that spiritual place, you see yourself as a comrade equal to God. I pray that you will bend your knee in humility and repent 
and be open to it. But this verse ma makes it very clear. It's an issue between you and you can take it up with God. So you don't have to argue with people. I mean, I will say my ire can sometimes get up when somebody just really um, gets real uppity or, you know, I know what it says and this is what I'm doing. And I'm perfectly fine in what I do. I need to not argue. I can just say, well, I beg to differ with you here. Let's look in scripture. This is what it says. And then from there, just leave it. Just leave it because then you take it up with God. Arguing isn't going to do anything, right? But living a faithful life of example in front of them may help. So then we see as we go forward, verses 9 and 10, I get such a kick out of because I think it's so wonderful. He says, but touching brotherly love with all the brethren. Oh, you know, we already know you're doing that, right? In chapter 1, we saw that he commended them, that as Timothy was making his way back, he's hearing and meeting believers that have met Thessalonians that have shared the gospel with them. So they're like, he's like, well, praise the Lord. And those very people shared with Timothy that he brought the report back to Paul that they had heard about Paul and Silas and Timothy's teachings from these people that introduced them to Jesus. So he already knew they were doing a good job of brotherly love. And when we say brotherly love, this is loving the church, loving the brethren, sharing the gospel. Um, they were doing a great job. But what does he say? He says, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That's the end of verse 9. You get into 10 and he says, and indeed you do it toward all of them. And then at the end, he says, we beseech you, brethren, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Hey, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Not just keep it up, but do it more and more. And this is in loving one another. This is why those in our Sunday school class, and we consider anybody that does my Bible studies and joins us, which right now we're on a hiatus for our Berean Bible study, which is more of mixed group oriented, but that anybody that's part of Steve and I's teaching, reaching um, group, we care about you. We care for you. And in our Sunday school class, I have loved over the years. I mean, this has been going on for 14 plus years. And um, when somebody dies, we all as a group, we just hated with Kathy's death that there was no way or place or avenue for us to really give um, to send a meal because there was nobody left and none of her family came and stayed up here. And, you know, anyway, but we've always been able to do that. And we, I, I just, I have always loved how the people in our Bible study and in our Sunday school class take care of one another. Um, you took care of me and Steve when mom was getting worse and visited my mother and, and, and prayed for her and kept her company. And, and some of you would come and sit with her or she would go out. Um, people who take each other to the doctor appointments. I know Jackie used to really um, help a lot and Terry with Kathy and, and along with us and others. And it was nothing when Kay was alive and others that if somebody, we found out somebody didn't have enough money for some bills for people to, cough up money to help and and that's caring for the for the brethren um visiting at the hospital uh just sitting with somebody um that's that's the love of jesus and that's what we see and that's why it's so important and this is what verses 9 and 10 are about i love verse 11 um and that you study to be quiet and isn't it interesting paul tells them to do their own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, remember when Paul and Silas and them, especially with Paul, with whoever he was with. He, now, he was a man who was a, like in church leadership in the Jewish communities. But as he went out in his Christian mission work and he would travel, there would have been people that would have housed him, put him up, fed him, and done all that. He wouldn't do it. Now, he may have gone to someone's home and stayed in their home, which happened often. We can talk of Lydia. We can talk of um, in Colossae. Uh, 
it starts with a T and I can't, is, can you read it? It's right there. Um, but all these different people that would put him up, but he would work as a tent maker to sell his own wares to support his work. Now people would give money to him and he would receive money, but even as the Thessalonians and the Philippians would share with other people in the churches, Paul would use that for the church. Because remember, many people would be lose their jobs because they could no longer participate in those horrible heathenistic guilds. They would lose their jobs. They would lose their homes. They would be abused. Their families would kick them out. And so the church itself had an entire listing. Each church was to list the true widows, which would be the widows and orphans, those who were on their own, children who came to Christ and children could have been, you know, 16 and 17 year olds that were kicked out of their homes because they followed that Jesus person, um, whatever. But they had, they had needs and people would sell their wares. You read in the book of Acts and in chapter 16, oh, all throughout Acts, you see people selling things as there was need in the church and, and sharing. And um, all of that was to support the church and to love one another. They will know you are Christians by your love one for another. And that is how we still are today. People still can't believe it if you give them an, a hand, if you pay for a bill, if you um, you support somebody putting them up somewhere, you know, in a hotel and giving them a, a few days of a place to live and shower. And they're like, why are you being nice to me? I mean, we've heard this so often. Steve is always ready to help people as much as he can. And why did you help me? Why did you give me this? Why did you do that? And what, what do you need? What can I give you? What do you want from me? And you know, all, you want to share the love of Jesus with them, but you can't demand anything back. That goes beyond what God has called us because they will know us by our love and be drawn and want to know more about Jesus because of what we do. So um, I say all that as we get into verse 11, because we also are to be, Paul took care of his business and stuff. You can't go about, you were not supposed to just decide, well, I, I, I'm just not going to do anything to contribute. The brethren will do it for me. No, you were to do a part, you were to be a part, busy, doing your own business. You have your own wife or your own husband. You take care of your own, which was expected, but then you also took care of others. And here, I have always, this passage has been very important to me during a time that I went through where, you know, when you're a part, you're an integral part of a very busy church activities everywhere. You're part of this committee, this group, this teaching thing. Um, I'm in a small church right now. And after COVID, everybody's not as active as before, but you can become really caught up in other people's business and wanting to, or the gossip thing. And at a time in my life, the Lord was really calling me to pull back and to not be so caught up everywhere else because I wasn't getting everything done well at home. And it wasn't my business to be worrying about everybody else. You know, even helping somebody, um, hey, how you doing? Everything going okay? I know you've been without work. Do you have enough groceries? You know, if you give them money, don't say, now you better not use this for cigarettes. You know what? If we give, we give. Um, now, we, we will... If people say they need gas, we, we go, well, come on, let's go. And we'll drive over to the gas station and we'll pump it for them. And that's, Steve does that often. Um, the church does that. Um, but it's not for us to get into their business. Um, and to take care of your own. What does it say? To work with your own hands as we've commanded you. Um, they were to be busy taking care of what they had of theirs. Scripture even says that you're an infidel if you don't take care of your own family. Now, many will say, oh, that, that doesn't mean anything but your own thing. Well, you know, we take care and even support those that are part of our family, as in like my brother and some others. And we take it very seriously. Others don't. They don't even take care of their parents their aunt and uncle that maybe is, has nobody else to take care of them. And over the years, the church has ended up having to put those widows and those so-called orphans um, that they start taking care of them. And that's what we do at our church too. But we are to primarily begin with taking care of our own business, right ladies? I mean, 
If you're gone from home all the time and your home is a disaster, you haven't taken care of your own laundry. I mean, we just talk about the, the dailies, right? Laundry, blah, 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 or your own home or your own husband. And you're always off busybodying or maybe you're not a busybody. You just like the activity and anywhere else but being at home. You need to go and work with your own hands and take care of your own because, next verse, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, that means outside of the church, and that you may have lack of nothing. You, There, there are people that, ha I mean, when I lost my job, there was nothing I could do about it. When I, I, I was laid off twice, and um, they were laying off people throughout the hospital the first time. And the second time I was laid off, the doctor's group broke apart, and they couldn't afford me. So the clinical director had to take over all the, the people that I was over. And then those people got, they had joined the hospital, and those people got dispersed everywhere. When I went back after they, shortly after they'd gone into the hospital, um, my, my office was changed into something else. And there was all of maybe three out of nine to 10 people that I was in charge of in a doctor's office that were completely gone and dispersed without, within the company to work and do what they did in our office through a, a corporate thing. And so, um, I had no say, I had no income, I had no insurance there are times and places and things that happen to people that they have no say on. And the Lord opens un doors and opportunities to get us out of that. But while we're in that thing, there are people in the street that are homeless that had nothing. They couldn't stop becoming homeless. Maybe they made bad choices, married to people who made bad choices. Whatever was going on, they weren't able to do it. But one of the big things, and of course, living back in the day 2,000 years ago would have been totally different than what we have today, but the concepts and the principles are the same. For the most part, if you take care of your own business and your things, and as a believer, you start to understand and learn how to do it God's way, it's not a promise that you will never be poor, but that hopefully you will be able to sustain yourself and live without a problem. Um with what you've got, whether it's with little or with a lot that will have it. But if not, in the body of the believers, we're to help one another, but not to help one another to never be able to get on our own feet, but to be a hand up to one another. You know what I'm saying? So the purpose is not just so that we lack nothing. And it doesn't mean, well, I want a fancy phone and I, I'm lacking the, the TV and you're not lacking food, a place to live, um, you know, your dry, you know, clean clothes, all of that. That's that's what you, what you're lacking nothing of. The fancy stuff that's not required. That's a whole other topic, right? But also that you walk honestly to those without. You know, Paul spends a lot of time. We even saw him in chapter two making making. Um, uh, standing on a position where people were accusing him of things um, that came in after him, the, the Judaites and all that, that were saying that he was a bad person, that he was tricking them, that he was trying to get their money and all these things. He lived in such a way, and the reason that he was a tent maker was he didn't want anybody, even the lost people or those in the church, to think he was scamming them or doing anything like that. He spends time in multiple of his letters um, Letting people know that he did that on purpose, that he knows what it is to be without, he knows what it is to have, and that he never comes to trick you or to steal from you or anything, but also that you give a good witness to those around you. You're not some lazy guy with your hand out. You know, the there's religions that everybody who becomes members, and we don't see it here, and it's not so big anymore, but back in the 60s and 70s, maybe in the 50s and on, where they had, you know, the under the something moon, the moon children, but they had to go out and beg for, for money from people, 
and from whoever. It wasn't from their followers. They were begging, and everything that they owned, they gave to the church, and they would go beg. Well, that didn't look good to anybody. They didn't like being harassed, and why should I give you money just because you don't got nothing? You gave all yours away, and um, it's not honest, and it wasn't a good thing, and unfortunately, many people have been sucked into cults like that, but we want to give a good report and be a good witness to everybody that we are we work with our own hands and we're honest people and we support ourselves as best as we can kind of thing like that this is where paul's going with that so um i hope this has been helpful um i hope that there's no problem that you struggle with this um i believe that most everybody on here i know and that you are this is not these are not issues for you but it is something to pray about that we are faithful um, earlier in, I think it's chapter 2, we, is it chapter 2, verse 12, that Paul, when he was discussing all those things that trying to, you know, let people know and assure them that he was not out to, to steal from them or lead them astray or misuse them, he said that um, he exhorted all of us that in verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12, you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory, just like he's called us unto holiness that we will be honest, humble, and seek after the things that God has taught us to do. Paul taught the church in ways that would be glorifying to him. And that is, number one, don't argue with God. See, be humble. Um, don't despise his word. Ask for guidance to reach out and to understand that if you've got issues in your life, you want to be more like Jesus. And to understand that that's it. And to love it, reach out and love the church. I mean, you know, we, we love you all and we are praying for you. And I know that you care about the others and those in your family and those in the church. Um, that was such an important call that Jesus put out, but also Paul and Peter reiterated and John and the others that we need to love one another. And I hope that this next week, it will be an opportunity for you to reach out to others, that you will um, consider verse 11 about if you've not been specifically taking care of your own business and your own things so that you can be walking honestly before people in the church and, and your neighbors and others, that you'll take time to consider whatever it is the Holy Spirit leads you unto. And I'm sorry that this took a little too long. I will end it now. I am praying for you. Lord Jesus, be with these ladies. Open their hearts to your word. And humbly, Father, I ask that they receive the teaching of the Holy Spirit within them, Lord, to confirm and to move forward and to change their lives to be more like you. In thy holy name, amen. Love you all.